Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today, I'm in conversation with a real man of words, Danny Gardner. In his professional life and times, Danny has been many things, actor, director, screenwriter, stand-up comic. More recently, he has written short fiction, flash fiction, aka shorter fiction, and the Pushcart Prize-nominated creative nonfiction piece, Forever in an Instant. In 2017, Danny published his first novel, A Negro and an Ofe. Set in the 1950s, that book introduced mixed-race protagonist Elliot Caprice, a disgraced Chicago police officer who finds himself caught between both sides of the law, not to mention the divisive worlds of black and white. Subsequently, Danny founded Bronzeville Books, an independent publisher focused on elevating voices and stories that have long been underrepresented and need to be told. Their newest offering, A Spoon Coon, features Elliot Caprice's return in a tale that finds the well-intentioned, if beleaguered investigator fighting to save his family's farm. Even his racial tensions flare, dead bodies keep turning up, and his ties to organized crime threaten to destroy him once and for all. Publishers Weekly gave the book a complimentary review, noting, Readers will cheer on Elliot as he tries, despite his cynicism, to do the right thing against almost impossible odds. Fans of socially conscious crime fiction will want to check Gardner out. And if this all sounds a bit personal, that's because it is. Danny Gardner says all his life experiences go into the batter that makes up his books. Stay tuned for an all-you-can-eat buffet of truth. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Welcome to episode 27 of Central Booking. I am in the virtual company of Danny Gardner today. Uh, new book, A Spoon Coon, just came out, and apparently I have one of the very few <laughs> physical copies, so be jealous, but it sounds like you can get your hands on it real soon. Uh, so I was thinking about how I could describe you, because I was going to call you a triple threat, and then I did a little more investigative work, and you're like, far beyond that. I mean, obviously wow. you're a novelist because I just held up your book, but you know, you've been an actor, a director, a screenwriter, uh, a comic. Now you're a publisher. You are right. kind of a master of all trades. And I feel very fortunate that you found a little time to sit down with me today. Oh, don't say it like that. We got to sell these books together, man. Like that's, I need you. That's right. <laughs> no, no. It's uh. well, if you look at it, what did you just say though? Right. You said, uh, you've broken down my 35, my lifelong career with words. So it's just, it's just words. Sometimes I have to be performative with words and sometimes I must be internal with words. And sometimes I must use words to communicate directly like in business or didactically or like you know, sometimes I gotta make a speech or something. Sometimes I gotta be funny with it. Sometimes I gotta add jokes. It's all just the word, you know? It's like in the beginning there was the word. I'm just in the I'm just in the words business and I like words so much. I try to find as many ways in which I may immerse myself with them and still call it work. Sure. And so, cause it's words, I got words. I'm from the Windy City. We all got words in the <laughs> shot, man. But um, it seems to be my thing, the word, you know, it seems to be how, you know, I'm able to convey not only my feelings, but the feelings of people I feel I have an empathetic bent for because they represent real people I've known in fiction. And it just, I've just known the kind of life characters and I've known the kind of homies and I've known the kind of friends and competitors and enemies in life that really make you want to spend some real words to talk about them, man. So I don't know, I'm just good at words. And, you know, my, my interesting cultural background makes me want to talk about all the things I've experienced. So I'm glad I got all these words. I, Maybe I'm a quadruple threat, or maybe I'm just a guy who only knows pancakes. I could be, you know what I'm <laughs> saying? Called I you the man of words. I know how to serve you 16 kinds of oatmeal. That's all. I'm Wilfred Brimley. That's all. I got the oatmeal. That's it. I like it. It would have been simpler. I should have just said Danny Gardner, the man of words. because you know, the man of oatmeal. <laughs> and the man of words and oatmeal. I like it. <laughs> that could be your memoir, you know, the next thing. But anyway, so I have to ask you, so speaking of books, so A Spoon Coon, The Tales of Elliot Caprice, yes. uh, just out, brand new, and I'm wondering if you can sort of give us the elevator pitch, because usually I do that for the author, and it's kind of funny, because I find that, you know, well, sometimes what you put into it and what I get out of it are two different things. 
but you are the man of words, so. Okay. All right. Well, I'll give you the, since, since we're in person in these digital times, I will take advantage of the full spectrum of your senses with all this technology. <laughs> um, so watch the fourth episode of Lovecraft Country and try to catch up on Perry Mason and you'll get the mood, the setting, and how black folks was living in Chicago at the time. And then you will open in 1950s Chicago, where we arrive with black folks having found economic parity in the middle class after a result of the great migration. So we got some class struggles along with some race struggles. And we once again return to our hero, the mixed race, mad mulatto protagonist, Elliot Caprice, half white, but he doesn't hold that against himself. And he leaps back into action to save his uncle's farm once again, who is always in danger of being foreclosed upon by the bank. While the new University of Chicago, a uh, University of Illinois Chicago campus project is causing some old crime bedfellows to come back to the fore and a few murders happen in relation to some funny money shifting around and the new Negro movement for civil rights is kicking full up and a lot of people is talking more than working. And Elliot Caprice finds a dead body outside of Abe Saperstein's pharmacy that seems connected to his old buddies in the black belt that involved all the old gangsters that took on Sam G and Connor and Johnny Torrey and those guys for power in the black belt. So return to Chicago in the 50s with Elliot Caprice, which is the black man's Westeros. And it's a Game of Thrones, but winter's always here in the shy. And uh, you'll see a guy battle against forces that would try to stop people from being able to control their own land value and hold back against economic sedition as a result of hostile policing and a mass media bent upon frightening people of color and other poor people out of what they rightfully own. And Elliot Caprice, he's a man who says if it's wrong and it happens in front of me, that makes it my business. If you didn't want me involved, you shouldn't have showed it to me. <laughs> and so he can't let it stand, especially not when people that he knows from his hometown are getting destroyed in the fray. So it's a lot of action, a lot of suspense, and it frames the American civil rights movement against the argument for those who might have had a difference of opinion. And it shows a nuance in the times that seem to provide for all people of all races to really get caught up in the passion and power of that movement. But I got your car chases and your shootouts with your black history. So don't worry, folks. It's still a good, pleasurable read by your bedside table. Tales of Elliot Caprice, Ace Boone Coon on sale now. I don't know what y'all doing, but we printing books around here. Bronze lips. How's that? Did it work? Did it go? Man, that was good. I'm like, we could stop right here. Like, what else is there to say? You sold it. You okay, just it's busted. hot, man. It's, it's hot. hot. I want out of this jacket. It's That's hot. right. The jacket comes off. I think it's time for you to eat dinner. I don't know. For <laughs> All right. That was great. So I am going to come back to the book a little bit more specifically soon, but you touched on a lot there, which was, I like that. That was a, that was a good yeah. sale. Hey, man, that's, uh, you know, it's interesting because folks relate my work back to the amount of the number of themes that I present in my work. And I always like to tell people, like when I speak in colleges and libraries and stuff, you know, they only themes if you ain't black. <laughs> you know what I mean? They think when you're black, themes are stuff that can happen to you at any minute while you already got your act together doing something else. You know, it's only themes for the passive reader who gets to enjoy black history, enjoy black history without right. taking it in the face first, right? So. Right. You know, I want you to not be afraid of the number of themes. Let's call them layers of Black life. And you get to ride along with Black folks in the 50s as we navigate and, 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 and try to carve out some inroads for ourselves. We're just hanging on to our bread while we taking the middle class. It's the 50s, man. We getting that post-war, too. You know, we're doing good. But uh, we have nuances and, and we have built-ins in the Black experience that you know, make an understanding and awareness of the themes you may be trapped in in your daily existence important. So I'm hoping that when you read these books, you'll be like, damn, Elliot, just get into this, get into that. It's like, hey, man, until I was 35, that's kind of how it was for me waking up every day. Sure. Sometimes it's just tough. And I know everybody feels that way. You ain't got to be half black and half white to feel like that, you know. So I'm thinking I might get it. I'm thinking I might, I think I might read some people in the heart bone this time, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's, 
our experiences are so different and you think that you have it bad and then you realize your idea of bad compared to somebody else's idea of bad, subjective, very different, you know. Yes. Yes. And that's, yeah. that's what I love yeah. about a book like this though. It allows you to, you know, viscerally experience maybe a life other than your own. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we have that gift of empathy. Uh, right. That's what I'm all about. I mean, right. you have I to agree. understand it, you know. I agree, I agree, I agree. So let me ask, actually, I'm just going to skip ahead in my conversation and then I'll come back a little bit more generally. But I did want to, you know, maybe talk a little bit about you draw in, you know, obviously it's a novel and it's a fictional world, but you draw in, you know, real places, real, oh, yeah. real people. Um, so it's really sort of historical fiction. And I think that sometimes, you know, just using the lens of fiction can make it palatable for a wider, more diverse audience. So can you talk about why you like to use fiction as your vehicle to explore all of these real life issues? Well, uh, okay, so the, I have a personal and I have a professional answer for both. And I'm going to deliver each as respectfully as I can, because I don't know who's going to be watching. Um, <laughs> I fictionalize real people because much in the way I don't own what happened to me growing up by myself, my brothers and I have to own that. These are real people who walked around in life who affected the mass social reality for millions. And through my research, I'm able to place them in history in a way that will allow, you know, my alter ego, Elliot Caprice, to interact with them. Because I grew up, like, in the Washington Heights neighborhood in Chicago, you know, I'm lighted in a paper bag. I speak the King's English. Of course, I got to go to some NAACP meetings. That's what they make a kid like me do, you know what I mean? But at the same time, these are real people. I remember shaking Jesse Jackson's hand. I remember Martin Luther King once being in my dad's living room. And I grew up taught not to brag, right? My grandfather was somebody, my father was kind of somebody. We were black folks that ran the fire department in Chicago and they didn't usually let a lot of black folks do that. So you kick up some dust. But we were taught not to brag growing up. We were taught not to lay it all out there. But man, I grew up with like head of the DEA and then his nephew, the head of the L. Rukins at the same doggone Thanksgiving table. You can't tell me not to write about that. <laughs> You can't you tell not? me not to write, right? You can't tell me not to write about these colorful characters that I grew up in in Chicago around because, well, Chicago might be, you know, the second city to some named for, you know, because it's the first city burned down. But Chicago is the capital of the migration. And I'm a migration grandson. So I know a lot of these people I'm writing about. And I know about some of these bodies where they got buried that I'm writing about. But I, I fictionalize these things out of respect. But I also fictionalize these things, and this is a little weird, but I don't mind. I fictionalize these things, and I even fuzz up some of these details so you go research your black history for yourself. Because it's your history, too. It's my history. If you're sitting in America, black history is American history. It built a nation. Right. So you should know these folks I'm writing about already. They built your country for you. There so you the way I see it, if I sprinkle a little bit, of Maddie Smith Collin, you might read about the Chicago Daily Defender and what it meant for America's communications at the time. Or if if I uh, if I mentioned someone you know pretty awesome like Abraham Heschel, you should understand that Abraham Heschel meant more to the American Civil Rights Movement than Gandhi did because it was Abraham Heschel that had the most influence on Martin Luther King's nonviolent civil rights policy. Abraham Heschel as a result of being, uh, uh, you know, working with Holocaust survivors, you know, when it was still, uh, you know, British controlled Palestine, and they was trying to deal with repatriation. They were healing people. They were remaking communities. This guy was talking to King every day, man. Abraham Heschel was fixing up Jews that survived the Holocaust and then calling Martin on the phone later, like, dog, let me tell you what these fools did today. Like, hey man, if I drop little hints and I drop little names and I spread a little funk on it, and you might pick up on it, and then you might just, like, read some James Baldwin for yourself for the first time. Helps the book industry, Absolutely. helps you remember Black Lives Matter, and helps you remember that uh, what a Black person does in this country to your glory and your benefit as a non-Black person is equally your American legacy. So you may be proud of the Black folks I write about, even if you're not Black, because they're Americans. 
And now you see it that way. So I mix it in the batter. You know, it goes in the waffle mix. You know, you don't really know what goes in some waffles. They tell you it's buttermilk in there, but you don't know. It's kind of like that. That's good. Man, we went deep quick. I like that. I've been living here, man. I've been swimming in the deep. You just kind of, you know, grab your floaties. Yeah, right. Grab them. <laughs> see, I thought we would ease into it, but I like this. It's the whole immersive experience, which is good, and it's what we need. And you know, I've been trying to be gentle. I've been trying. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I like it. But and I wanted to ask you too. You know, there are so many people who will say, "Well, the past is the past," and I always come back to the saying, "The past is prologue." You know, we continue a lot of times to make the same mistakes, have the same misperceptions. Can you talk a little bit about? you know, historical fiction and how it resonates today? Because reading this book in the times that we're living oh, yeah. in, it is very relevant and it's scarily resonant, despite the fact that it took place in the 50s. And then you think, well, really, you know, some things have changed for the better, but how much? Well, well, let me, let me, uh, let me reflect on the fact that, like, I'm a young dude, but I got started living early. And, um, Okay, so basically my grandfather, John Lehman Gardner Sr., um, he was run out of Thomas County, Georgia when they burned it down, like around the same time they burned down Tul Tulsa, Oklahoma, like you saw in uh, the excellent HBO show, uh, uh, The New uh, uh, Watchmen, right? And you remember how they opened Watchmen and they framed it all around the bombing of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the racial run, right? My grandfather, right around the same time before the Red Summer of 1919, he and his mother, who normally passed for white, couldn't survive in a town where she was a white woman with a half black baby because my grandfather was a mulatto. And so they ran north to Chicago after they got burned out of Thompson County, Georgia. And, you know, 25 years later, my grandfather is a fire department captain as a black man in the city of Chicago. And... Um, I was raised by him. I knew him in my lifetime. I still have a relationship with my grandfather's aunt who was born 15 years after he migrated to Chicago. I still have things about him in my library. I still understand what he expected from me as his grandson. These things are accessible to me and not to other people because, you know, the, the line between education and commerce means some books disappear and other ones don't. But these books disappear to your detriment because much of political policy in the United States is predicated on what we don't know about each other and the way we have to put up fences between our communities to try to control what we feel is our identity. Right. But if you look at historical fiction, you will learn that these things that seem to vex us and perplex us about coming together in society today have already been resolved era by era mm -hmm. by era. Okay, now if you were a Reconstruction Black congressman sometime in 1860, that's when they made you three-fifths of a human being, but you had about 30 years in the Reconstruction South to get your money on a whole political power. And there were 12 Reconstruction Black congressmen that through sedition of their peers on the floor of Congress rendered them three-fifths of a human being for the car ride home. Except if you was a Black congressman in the city of Chicago around the same time, you was riding on the front cart smoking cigars with white boys on the way home. And that happened and we figured it out and we came together and we sorted that out. But just because somebody in publishing ain't trying to print the book that tells you that happened, don't mean you got the right to forget that we sorted this racial mess out already. And I'm trying to get to the new stuff. I'm trying to get to Mars, man. I'm trying to see who's farting on Venus right now. Right. I don't need to be bothered with what my grandparents already showed you. You ain't better than black folks and you need black folks to fight your fires. Don't go making us too mad. We have a shared legacy. We can sort this out. So I'm just reminding y'all, these dope uncles and grandfathers and cousins that I got, look, man, I took the DNA test. I'm half white. Half of y'all look like me with my name, a white as hell. But it's your book too. And if it exists within me, and if the black and the white exist together, then the whole nation is a mulatto and we're all cousins. So pull your hair out of your rear and read a dope mystery about the ways in which we normally related with each other when we didn't have 80 layers of government and a whole lot of people changing the rules for us every 10 years. That's what it is. We fixed this already. Just remember that we fixed it and then we'll get on with it. And so, and then you're like, my uncles are dope, man. My cousins are dope. Like black folks are fun. 
like black folks in Chicago, they're a different kind of black folks. Y'all know 50 Cent and Snoop Dogg. Y'all don't know these Chicago black folks I'm giving you. So they're entertaining. And they're your friends, right. and your family. And like, we're all, we're all mixed in, man. We're all colluded now. If the nation does well, we all rise. And if the nation does poorly, we all got to fix it. And that's kind of what my books are about. It's just that, you know, race is sexy right now. So uh, that's, the, that's the backdrop by which I can frame any one of these arguments. But in reality, it's a Midwestern tale about how when you leave people alone long enough and there ain't no guns and there's plenty of seeds and farmland, we learn how to get along. Right. Fix that. Absolutely. Fix that. That worked. Fix right. it. I don't know. I can go on forever, man. It's just, you know, like I'm, I'm having a great launch week, but there are still things that need help. So I just try to sometimes, you know, I know I'm a heavy dude. I know I pack a lot in there, but I don't know when the next time a black guy like me is going to be able to talk to everybody for sure. Right. So I got to get it in, man. I, more people than me need to know. Absolutely. You know, more people need to know what's going on and that we can fix this. You know? No, I love that. And I mean, I get it. That's, like the power of books. And that's why I'm always telling people, pick up a book, you know, and read something about something that you might not know or somebody you might not know. And then you will feel like you do and you will see the commonalities and you will see the common ground. And that's, you know, I think that's why I keep coming back to books. And I find in this crazy uncertain time that that has been my sanity. And I feel mm -hmm. very fortunate that I can still fall into a book where I know a lot of people who used to be able to, who can't, like that is my salvation at the end of the day, even if they're, you know, they're dark and they're heavy, it's reality, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. humanity and that commonality. Yeah. And yes, indeed, 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 any genre, pick one, yeah. pick one. If it helps you escape and you get to think what it may be like to relate with someone else in some kind of, you know, deep, adventurous, dark or moody or romantic or sexy situation, man, you, you don't you're seventy five percent of the way in their in their shoes already. So, go all the way. Get to the end. Close that book. If it made you man, if you had to throw it across the room ten times, that's probably more exciting than that last episode of reruns you watched. Yeah, get the blood flowing. You know. And I was going to tell you, you were telling me about the Watchmen before, and I'm like, oh gosh, I haven't seen it because I don't watch TV hardly ever. I ain't got nothing to say. I ain't got nothing to say. You can read that out of the TV guide. I hope I didn't. Spoil it. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. <laughs> going to say, but that's okay, because I'm reading things like your book, so I don't feel so bad about it. Oh, man, yeah. stop. Man, my head. It's only so much in this window here. It's I know. I was going to say, oh, don't expand. Um, <laughs> but no, no, that was really good. And I want to say, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed um, about meeting Elliot Caprice for the first time, even though I know he was in another book, which, of course, now I'm going to have to check out. Um, but I love that you take a character and you sort of show us a different perspective on the race dynamic because when we think about race in America, we think white versus black, black versus white, and then here we have a character who's half white, half black, and so he's too white for the black people, too black for the white people, and it, you know, it made me think like, this is going to sound weird, but when Gloria Estefan talks about, you know, crossing over from Latin music to English music, and they wanted to release Conga as a single, and the record label said, nobody's going to listen to that because it's too Latin for the Americans, it's too American for the Latins, and it worked beautifully. And I was thinking of that as I'm, you know, travel on, traveling along with Elliot Caprice. And can you talk about, you know, obviously you mentioned your grandfather, yourself, um, but why that particular dynamic with Elliot? Because I think it really does give a fascinating bent to sort of the, the race conversation because you have to look at it differently. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, so here's a perfect example, and I'll try to encapsulate. Um, I mean, I grew up, my dad's birth certificate says colored because he was born in 1945 in Cook County after the post-war in June 29. And... Um, uh, my, and his birth certificate for, is issued by Cook County, Illinois, so it's colored. My ma, Rosalita Gardner's birth certificate, uh, uh, was issued also by Cook County in 1947, and her raised classification was printed Negro. I, in 1971, some years later, was issued a similar birth certificate. My race of classification said B-L-A-C-K. And I have a child who was born in Blue Island, Illinois, in hospital back in 1991, 
and she has a birth certificate that says African American. But when I took the 23andMe and the Ancestry.com, because you know I was I lost my parents at a young age, and I need to fill in some blanks about health and heredity and things right. like that. By virtue of the racial classifications that get reframed every time they want to call black people something new, and then by extension, everyone else, dude, I'm half white. I'm 29% Nigerian, 35% anything that makes you an uh, English colonist. And then it just depends. Like nobody would have called a Scots Irish a white boy in 1971 when I was born, but somehow they got white between then and now, and you add them 13% to my racial category. Like it's nebulous, it's all over the place. We're all mixed in. We're all sleeping with each other. And Fleming was sleeping with some black dude in 1511 to get here with me. Like, we've done this. There is the only time we segment people based on race. And the only reason why we put genetic litmus, litmus tests out there is because people just don't have enough of anything. Okay, so we the Irish, we got this neighborhood, we staying over here. Don't come over here if you ain't Irish. And then all of a sudden, the 23andMe tells you that the Irish family you would have died for, half of the most was German and they didn't even know it. That's right. Like, we've been had, man. We've been had. You know, somebody wants to lower the home value across the street so they can build a Comiskey Park. They call across the street from the white folks, the ghetto, put a red line around it, say, we're sorry, blame the blacks for losing half your equity, and then they get off with the bags of money in the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, I was cool with them white boys, but now they dad said we can't play together. Mm -hmm. Okay? I mean, just look. We ain't even got bees no more. We're losing bees, though. Yeah. We're losing forests. We're losing a lot. Race is off the table. I got a guy who's half black and a guy who's half white because he can't get away from himself. Like we can't get away from each other. And now what are we going to do? We're going to burrow in and we're going to take DNA tests and we're going to find out just how white we are, just how black we are, just how black we ain't, just how white we ain't. It's over. Just spread it out. Living wages, fix supply chains, make schools do what they used to do. Keep them doggone libraries open. And make certain that somebody can get home after a hard day's work to help raise their kids before the other parent gets home. And this race mess is the second, secondary tertiary consideration of most Americans. It only comes to the fore when we're starving in places that we don't want to talk about. We're only talking about race right now because we're not talking about brown women's uteruses. I hate to say it like that, but that's out there right now. Right. Now, I, I'm not the one who caused all this crazy chaos in the world. I'm just doing, trying to sell a book in it. Right. And I'm just telling you, the race thing, I don't know, man. Little kids, you know, women being locked up, forest fires burning. No, I know. Okay? Shy town shooting. You know I'm black. Y'all like Mariah and them. Y'all like Whitney Houston. It'll be a black person singing the national anthem in some Ford event in three, two, one, I matter. Wake up, just remember, I know you're hungry, I know you're sick, I know you're tired, but don't be mad at me. We used to be friends before they started turning the heat up on us. That's all I'm trying to say. So I made the guy half black and half white so he can't escape what America needs from him. You know, you can't be like, oh, well, that's the blacks. That's right. their problem. And you can't be like, well, that's them white folks. They're the ones voted for Trump. Nah, Elliot can't run. He's got to face it. He's got to face America's promise. And he's got to face his denial of America's promise for himself and the people that he cares about. Because if America's promises doesn't, don't mean anything to him, they ain't going to mean anything to his whole town. And he's going to have to feed them instead of achieving his individual glory. So, you're like, you know, I want everybody to kind of feel a little more black in the sense that black people all know in the end, we all tied to each other for our survival. I don't know if other races of people understand that in America, you know, you've been taught that you can bring your individuality from somewhere else and find purchase here. But if you hang out with some black folks after you get here, you realize, you know, the seed belongs to the soil. The seed isn't a gift. The soil, the seed returns to the soil from which it was intended to be grown from. And that's the collective 
And hey, man, I can have all of the book launches and I can have all of the nice homes and I can have all the California sunshine, but in the shadow, the people I write about are suffering and I got to do something. Mm -hmm. And that's when we all have to do something. So if you love this half black, half white dude, which he'd say black and I'd say black because I'm half black, half white, and I'd say I'm black, but y'all don't care. He's handsome. He's got curly hair and light skin and stuff. And like, he'll be doing all of the cool stuff in the mysteries that you want your mystery protagonist to do. But he's doing it carrying around the promise of America. And he's getting robbed, both sides of him. Right. The white boy ain't doing no better than the Negro and Elliot. Right. And that should be a lesson to people. Absolutely. Well, it makes you think, and that's sort of what I look for in my books. Like, oh, so and it's sexy, man. It's exotic. I don't understand why being a half black, half right, mis white mystery writer who claims claims black all the way down to the to the gangs and the shy. I don't know why that's sexy in twenty twenty. I don't. Uh, you know, I don't know why it's just you know uh, like a struggle for genre fiction to represent things. But uh, I mean, like. Ooh, I, race is so nebulous now. Mm -hmm. What if you? I, I think I would like to define my race. I, I'm black because that's my soil I'm planted in. Yeah, I got stories for writing novels because I'm black. I got uh, lessons for how to remain resilient in tough times because I'm black. I got a legacy. Because, you know, folks coming up here to try to escape some tyranny and then yet they found success. I got, I got you know, I got plans. If it worked for my father and my grandfather, maybe it'll work for me. Blackness gave me all of that. And now Blackness gave you that book. And it's like, hey, man, like, we exchange the stuff. We good. And then, hey, it'll be like Earth, Wind, and Fire again. Weed is getting legal in most states. Pretty soon, no one's going to have a problem with any of it. <laughs> True enough. And, you know... I want to talk a little bit about genre fiction, if you don't mind, because oh. you brought it up, and I think it's one of the most interesting arguments that, you know, people sometimes tend to look down on genre fiction, regardless of what the genre is, and I think that, you know, if you look at crime fiction and the subgenre doesn't matter, but I think it's some of the most real, resonant, topical, timely fiction that you're going to find. So can you talk a little bit about why it is that you were compelled to write about crime and, you know, how that lends itself to a, to a much fuller story? Because people who haven't read these books, you know, and who might not know a mystery say, eh, it's a mystery. That's not my thing. I'd rather read literary fiction. And there's nothing wrong with literary fiction. But I say, pick up a mystery and it's going to blow your mind because you are going to understand who people are, why they act the way they do, what their motivations are, where they come from, who they come right. from. Right, right, right. I, uh, now, 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 it's interesting that we approach it from the academic side of the thing. You know, we're AWP in it right now instead of voucher kind in it right now, right? I get um, Literary fiction is generally written and pitched out toward readers who already have their minds made up about a lot of things. Genre fiction is for those who have a bit of a clearer palette and want to maybe see what they may be about in themselves in relation to the world before they step out there and take their chances. We're a little bit nerdy. We're a little bit introverted. You know, we're a little bit misunderstood. We have ideas and concepts and values that a lot of people don't understand. Something that we read in the issue of the X-Men actually defines us as people. And you can't explain that to anybody except another one like us. And it's probably not going to be until Monday when you get to school that you can talk to somebody. Right? Like, see, we're the dreamers. We wouldn't have a space program without Ray Brad Bradbury, Brad Bradbury putting it in people's heads. We could get there. And we had that every week. You know, we had genre fiction coming out in magazines for little kids to read with the cornflakes because we didn't have a TV and stuff like that. And yet, now, books seem to be back in style. And literary fiction is seeming to having to compete with mysteries and adventure, action, suspense, uh, 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 men's adventure is something that I think is cool. Man, I was thinking about writing some, some mishaps and some black adventures who like, just keep forgetting what their goal is because they keep on having a good time and they don't ever get back to the like, Indiana Jones stuff. They just hang out. Like, I don't know, I, it is, it's life there. 
I mean, I read a lot of genre fiction. I grew up in the library, Carter G. Woodson Public Library back in Washington Heights. And you know, man, they didn't care if a little guy like me went to the adult library. Like, you know, the children's library wasn't always, you know, my only place. Right. And I read Jim Thompson back then. I read Donald Westlake, but I had no business reading that stuff. My father killed me catching with them books, but they, I left them in the library. If I didn't take them out of the library, it's no crime. And then, um, you know, man, I, I, I used to, I, I used to understand uh, I've actually had a good time catching up on my education later in life because I have a genre fiction background and most genre fiction writers are writing 10 times as harder to keep up with all the hype and hubbub against genre fiction. I mean, I know I'm using SAT words. I know a guy like Jonathan Mayberry is using some, a little, that ain't soft sci-fi he writing. I mean, hey man, you know, me and Walter Bosley, we be beefing and stuff because it's funny, right? Because we both light skinned, so it's funny. And I love Walter, right? I think Walter is, you know, the dopest science fiction writer I ever read. And to make myself feel good about Launch Week Jitters, I've been reading Blue Light. Man, you could buy that. That's Walter Mosley writing crime for writing science fiction. You ain't seen that. No. So I'm saying you haven't seen it. You'll read it and you'll go, damn. Like, there's no way to make you eyebrows curl back the concepts the trippiness the psychological freaking scare ratio of this thing and then i grew up you know it's about like it's about drugs and cosmic experiences and yet what happens with drug abuse in the 60s and Hyde asbury becomes this whole trippy thing some you know some blue light comes from the cosmos and uses these fractured consciousnesses with the lsd and they tripping and they don't know what to do to give them like real powers Walter mostly has some superhero trilogy straight up grown from out of San Francisco back in like 1992 between Always Outnumbered, Always Outgunned and that next subsequent Easy Rollins novel. And I'm telling you, Asimov wrote that, man. It's amazing. We genre fiction writers, we're the dreamers, and we, in we increase our ability as human beings to understand our potential by our unsatisfied dreams. I'll never get to Mars, but I keep dreaming about it and writing about it. My grandkids might get to Mars. Sure. And you can't say that about, like, you know, Jonathan Franzi. You might be able to. You might. Jonathan, if you're listening, I ain't trying to start a beef or nothing. I'm trying to get into these. I'm trying, I'm trying to get out of these writer beefs, man. Like, they meant, nobody wants to see a writer fight. You know what I mean? <laughs> the most boring fighters. <laughs> 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 our curses are, are long-winded like mine yes, and then other people have to look them up it's just this is all, all sexy fighting <laughs> uh, all right so to take a step back um okay. i mentioned a little bit earlier that this is the second book that you've written uh mm -hmm. featuring elliot caprice and i know that some people are hesitant to come into a series at book two um i can say you know having not read the first book it's really a non-issue. I mean, it's just, it's immersive. The characters are engaging. The story is just very compelling. But can you talk about, as a writer, um, how it is that you maintain narrative momentum for people who've been with you from first book to second, while, you know, people who might be reading this new book, A Spoon Coon, and who might not know Elliot, how you sort of catch them up without that, that lag space or losing the intensity? Okay, I'll tell you exactly how to do it. All right. Should I take I it want you to, I want you to take a cheese grater, <laughs> and the next time you step out of the shower, I want you to rub it all, of your, all over yourself, and then I want you to squeeze lemons. <laughs> and I want you to rub lemons all over your cheese grated skin fresh out of a hot shower. Now, I want you to imagine having to do that. I want you to have to sit there for five minutes suffering. If you can imagine that, then you'll imagine what it takes to read every unsolicited review about your book. You're going on the Goodreads. You take your medicine. Maybe you get high. I like a little sativa hybrid myself. If it's legal where you live, I suggest it. But the most I'll ever learn about my mistakes and point of view with the first book came from the reviews of the first book that I bitterly read and sucked down and took in the, the second book. I found what I was doing wrong. I found what 
readers were getting right. I found what I was being misunderstood about. I decided whether or not they cared about, cared enough. So if I cared enough or not to be understood about these things, if I did, I had to write them better as I go on. It shows interest. If they say, I like this, but I was confused, they like it. I'll fix the confusion throughout the series. Oh, well, I don't know why he would do that. Seems weird. Well, you'll find out in book three, because I got thoughts and feelings about that already. But man, your readers will tell you what they want to see. We're all chasing TV now. We're all chasing binge watching. Books have to keep up with a lot of other mediums that compete for psychological residue in your brain, right? It helps me with Ace Boom Coon that there's a lot of hot stuff on the TV right now set in the same period with black folks in. And there's a lot of cool racial issue stuff. I mean, HBO, man, it's the third series in a row that they're talking about breaking through this race thing. And it's not like a big weird deal to everybody. I'm like, hey, man, this is cool. Yeah. So you're riding the zeitgeist, right? But man, I'm telling you, I just... It's kind of hard that, okay, so I got a friend of mine, he's a thriller writer, Tom Avatable, and, you know, he's not exactly what you call a Democrat. And Tom Avatable pulled me to the side and said, Danny, I don't know who's giving you your notes, and I don't know who's, uh, who's helping you with your proofreading, but you got to be careful because sometimes people who aren't Black are afraid to criticize you and what you're doing because they don't want to be taken as racist. And what they're, they're really trying to do is tell you to take a right workshop. <laughs> and I said, well, my skin's pretty raw, man, after being in genre fiction for about five years, trying to get people to notice me and notice my life matters. So I'm going to try that. And I just found people who helped me with my notes uh, I found fast friends in the crime fiction community. This dude named Rob Hart got a great book out called The Warehouse. You know, he shared with me some, some information about firming up point of view so that they would get my transitions better in the next book. Uh, my man Joe Clifford helped me like edit like the first five chapters 86 times. I think I wrote the last, the fifth chapter before I sealed the deal in, uh, in his house in San Francisco. Uh, and then I went to, I went to, uh, I do readings a lot. Sure. People tell you, man, when a little kid comes up to you at a college, read your book and said they love to interplay with like, say, Elliot and Frank Fouquet. You know you need Frank Fouquet in the next book. That's right. And you know somebody's going to want to read it. I, I, I came into this uh, not being arrogant enough to think I knew what to write. I just knew I had some stories, man. And I just started like a tapeworm that started coming out, right? And then everybody told me what they liked about it. And I didn't, you know, it hurt when I found out what they didn't like about it or what they couldn't understand or what they couldn't rock with. But I found out if I just, you know, didn't worry about that so much. My, you know, readers were trying to become fans and tell me what they wanted to know about. And then it's like, hey, Uncle Danny, tell me another story. And right. it's like, I always got a story. Sure. And so, but I only have one frame of reference. I'm a black kid from the South Side of Chicago. I had a pretty idyllic upbringing. And, uh, you know, I kind of cornered that market, but I only have so much stuff to write about. So, um, you know, the history is ongoing. I've anchored it to the civil rights movement. That has a bona fide history you may follow. Right. And then it's like, you know, the narrative value of it is that in the end, I'm writing about real black people. And I'm writing about the, the people that they loved and, and, and fought with and struggled against and, and rose up with in cooperation. And the limits to that history will only allow me so much in the confines if I'm getting history right and y'all like the characters and the feedback's coming in strong, I might be able to make up another batch of waffles for another book. And usually the waffle's gonna taste the same because I really only got the one recipe, which is show you how beautiful black life is so you don't get buyer's remorse once it starts mattering. Right, sure. You know what I mean? Absolutely. But that's it. Like, friends help me. Um, and you know, man, I got my favorites too. I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm pretty much, everybody says, well, what are you reading now? And I'm like, uh, Ibrahim X. Kennedy? Because that's the only book I know because I'm reading a lot of books. I got to work. So, um, you know yourself. You know if what you're giving is 
your angelic self or your or your darker self. You know if it's some shadow side contributions to the conversation or if you're giving light. And if it's your light, it'll tell you what it wants to do. And maybe some of them characters that you love so much, maybe, you know, they got to go. Maybe uh, the situation. I was angry. I was angry about a lot of personal stuff, writing what I thought was going to be Ace Boom Coon. And then the world started changing. Right. And then I realized I needed to write about something else. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I, I like that everybody likes it. And I like that folks are liking that I kept the world consistent. I know a lot about continuity from going to film school and stuff. Sure. And I know a lot about um, storytelling from having worked in the Hollywood writing rooms from time to time. Like, you might get a job for, like, two episodes, you know? Right. So you only, you only write in episodes five through seven. Right. And some dude okay, so you got you know you gotta keep that straight, right? Because it's not your work. You don't run the place. You can get fired if you miss something. But uh, uh, fans, people who like me, I had an idea. Elliot is kind of like you know the half black, half white part of me that you know didn't wear ties and write novels. So you know I uh, you know if I if I've told enough secrets, I know the book's finished. If I'm feeling exposed, like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna embarrass myself with some stuff I included. I know I'm finished, but Good ending. Um, yeah. And bloggers, bro, bloggers, they're brutal. Oh okay, yeah. Look, like, uh, like David Nemeth, if you read his his reviews, you might hear some stuff he didn't like about your book. Reviewers right. like that. Um, Publishers Weekly said, long on action, short on detection. And I kind of took offense to it, even though I realized it was a good quote. Because I didn't know nothing, right? You know, I mean, I'm used to a big Hollywood extravaganza. They didn't absolutely love it. They hated it. Stop the presses. Like, I didn't know, like, something like that. If Publishers Weekly has anything good to say at all, you did okay, right? If they That's have right, any, yeah. any reaction at all. If you yeah. made them feel something to think something, right? Absolutely. But I didn't know that at the time, so I took it personal and I overcorrected. And now I gave myself like a really tight plotted mystery, so then I don't say that again. <laughs> right? So I'm kind you of a... You made the great argument for, you know, authors who say they don't have the emotional bandwidth to deal with reading. Oh, uh, man. Hey, yeah, if I was... Learn. <laughs> if this was novel 15, I could make that argument. This is novel number two, y'all, man. I could have lost it all here. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Whatever you think I should write, just send it to me, and I got you hooked up. <laughs> All right, so much more generally, I'm going to ask you, you know, I know you've written a lot, short fiction, memoir pieces, flash fiction, but this is your second novel, and a lot of people um, tend to say that the second one can be the hardest to write. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, I, you haven't finished the third one yet, I don't think, uh, but what was... Close. Well, oh, good. Close. <laughs> So, so in thinking about, you know, the first one and the third one that you're getting, you know, close to finishing, how do you see this second one is relating to that? Did you find that there was a difference, you know, in writing it? Was it more challenging? Was it more liberating? Well, you know, I, uh, the cool thing about it for me is that I had the nervous jitters, you see. I was afraid that um, now that I had everyone's attention, I would be nervous about like shooting my shot, right? Everybody was kind of cool with a Negro and no fair. I got away with this crazy rambunctious title. Uh, my subject matter was pretty raw. Up until that time, folks weren't layering race and racial issues in America from the contemporary condition in their fiction, like, you know, Walter was doing it right and then you know henry chang wrote chinatown beat which is like one of my favorite books and he humanized the struggle for chinese economic parity in new york and i knew that was a chance people would be interested in it. you know but uh yeah man it's like with two novels and you know people are paying attention and okay so i have an older brother we don't get along but like you know He's like the older brother that you got that knows you, you know? And so you can't grow with him standing there because, you know, you can't get a break long enough to kind of like mess up, right? You need to make some mistakes to find out who you are. And my older brother, Walter, Walter, my grandfather's name, all the Walters never liked what I'm doing. And so you know, my older brother, Walter, 
you know, he says to me after Def Comedy Jam, and I'm thinking about quitting my new job at Northwestern University, and I'm going to go back out there because, you know, my mama died, and I had to stop my career. But I like, And he said, Danny, you got children. And he said, Danny, you have a devastating ability to lead, but I'm more worried about your ability to mislead. And, you know, man, and that was just like, man, that fuck. You know what I mean? That's like, whatever. You know, I'm not going to listen to that. But right. it's haunted me since then. Because then I did Deaf Comedy. Like, I remember doing Deaf Comedy Jam. It felt so weird because wasn't nobody laughing because it seemed like I was serious and talking. Right. I mean, they laughed when I told them to because I was, like, looking serious and focused and stuff. Like, you know, Obama, pull your brunts up. Like, that kind of shit, right? Uh -huh. And so two novels proves I'm not misleading people. They don't give you a full page interview in the Sun Times. I don't get to sit with somebody smart like you reads the book and asks me to be a human in front of you if the book sucks. You know, there's only so much a vanity press can do for a guy. I've had the kind of week where, you know, I'm not misleading anyone, maybe. I mean, my brother really messed me up with that, man. Yeah. And, you know, but like, you know, that's, that's what it is when you're from my family. You get a scar and you never forget. So, you know. I know I'm not misleading people. I know I'm carrying a story and I know that I have something to write about and people buying books and stuff. I got pre-orders, we got books in warehouse, they're going out, like, I can relax a little bit. I'm not gonna mislead anybody, like, and you know, like there are a lot of great book bloggers, a lot of great reviewers, and you know, man, I ain't friends with a lot of these cats in genre fiction and we'll argue, we'll fight, but we respect each other because, you know, I go for what's mine just like them, right? Right. But that all needs the dough. That all agitates the wash water. Sure. And, you know, I just, uh, you know, it's kind of messed up, man. Like, my grandfather called me, was, you know, after I did Def Comedy Jam. Like, the Izzy Rabinowitz thing, when Izzy Rabinowitz turns uh, Elliot's phone on in book one, it's interesting. And uh, that happened to me. That was my grandfather who did it to me. That's why I included it in the book. And he's, you know, he's talking to me, man. And, you know, I'm trying to fight for this Def Comedy Jam thing. And I'm, like, 19. You know, I got, a, I got a wife, I got two kids. I think I'm gonna make this work. And you know, my grandfather's like, young man, I saw you on the, on the TV and on the Def Jam comedy. Cause you know, they always get the name wrong and they don't respect right. it all. Right? right? I saw you on the Def Jam yeah. comedy. You look with the Russell Simmonses. Like, you know, they can't even respect me to get the name right, the old man, right? And he said, he said it was, he said it was my intelligence and my, my literary skill and my ability to problem solve as a business person has set me apart from people. He said, you don't do black people any justice when you just go out there and be funny. We're all funny, because we all hurt. You need to do more with your words and just entertain hurting black people. You need to help them. And I'm just like, again, I'm like, yeah, but where you at though, right? Because I'm a kid, I'm sitting at home, I got hard times, got this rich grandfather, he ain't trying to help me, but he was. And so, you know, I'm kind of relieved now, you know, like my, like, 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 here, hold on. Let me show you. So, my dad's sister is a school teacher who come educated in Chicago, right? She got degrees and degrees, right? And she's like, you know, my grandfather comes to Chicago as a result of the Great Migration. It is fire that burnt him out of his town. And so, you know, he's going to be riding his family about education the whole way, right? And my dad's sister, my dad didn't even finish high school. He just joined the fire department. He just started boxing. He started doing everything I do. He was an 80 threat. He was a triple threat, too. A triple threat, you know, felt a lot of good. You know, my, my, my father was a brilliant man. And he was a hero in the fire department. And I wish they knew something about mental health back then. Right. And yet, so, my, so his sister, though, his older sister, who was taught to ride him, the whole way. I just came over from China to see about what I may be able to do to establish my own printing house. And she hands me this, which is a copy of Viewpoints from Black America, signed by her in 1965. Oh, wow. Annotated and scribbled in notes. Oh, and yeah. if I'm not publishing anything like this, I'm wasting my time. These the black folks that have been calling me lately and saying, I'm proud of you. And they wasn't calling me after Def Comedy Jam saying that. And it hurt my feelings and made me mad. 
And, you know, my friend Lucinda taught me a long time ago, if somebody says something about me and it makes me mad, it's probably true. Sure. I have more to do in my life. Uh, I'm still the funniest guy in the barns. and nobody still do stand up. But I really feel like, you know, you can't throw this at me at Thanksgiving no more. Right, absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, okay, get off my back now. Like, I get it. I'm black. I belong to something bigger than me. Black is beautiful. Black is American. And I have responsibilities to that. But at least I still did some things that I wanted to do to give me the kind of perspective that helped me create a character like Elliot. Because I'm hoping that, like, you know, I'm hoping 15 year olds they ain't got no business being in the adult section of the library read it. And maybe they'll misbehave in ways that help them feel heroic and, uh, and stoic in the face of unchanging circumstances. And, you know, to, to step past crime when you're hungry right. and when you're frightened. And, in, and, and then step past judgment of others who may be lost in crime because we don't know why they're suffering. And I could do that with some stand-up. I could do that with a novel. I could do that with a screenplay. I could do that with just like taking some poems out on the street and getting my griro on, man. But like, it's all just words. And I love words. And my parents sent me to the Chicago public school system to taught me that I could be one with words. And it's all just words. And we always got words and we should share them. And I'm sharing them. And if you want some, I'm printing books as fast as I can. <laughs> Great. I was going to say, all those early experiences, it just goes into the batter, right? That's I mean, it. It's a That's better it, batter baby. because of it. <laughs> you got it. Put some butter and some, and some maple on it. It's good eating. <laughs> Who cares if it tastes a little funky every now and again? It's flavor. That's right. All right. So it's been almost an hour. I'm going to wind it down. I just have a couple quicker questions for you, if you don't mind. Okay. So, Actually, I think this piggybacks on what you were talking about really nicely, but I did want to ask you about Bronzeville Books because um, right. you founded that. So you were, you know, writer, publisher. Can you talk a little bit about um, that? Your oh, yeah. Well, okay. So uh, I had a pretty good thing going on in the beginning with writing literary fiction, but, you know, I only had the one thing. And that's I got that, like, cool push card nomination and uh, literary orphans journal share with me and people started paying attention to me I was like well I got this kind of mystery novel I never wrote one before would you like to read it and all of a sudden it's like oh dude this is dope oh wow this is great wow 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 I can help you wow 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 and, you know I start finding all these fast friends and it's all fun and, and it's all lovely and then um, you know I write this novel it's coming out of my family stories you know I'm trying to put some comedy into it you know I'm trying to like have all this fun and then I remembered I'd done a thing or two in entertainment before, and I know how to put on a show. And in the meantime, Eric Campbell from Down Now Books was nice enough to save me from a publisher that fell on some hard times and unfortunately couldn't move forward with publishing me, even though they intended to. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself at the bottom of the marketplace with folks that was really trying to hang out and stay in the business. And Eric Campbell was publishing guys and really helping them get their names out there. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we like this. And it blew up, right? But then I'll be in getting packed for Noir at the Bar Toronto. And those guys, I'm coming from LA. I, you know, that ain't a car ride. Right. You know? <laughs> and they can't get books there because distribution patterns are all messed up. And they can't, you know, I can't get books to like the Book Passage Mystery Writers Conference because we just got some problems in the global supply chain as a result of consolidation that haven't been rectified because too many systems have to be merged every time Bookmasters is bought by Baker and Taylor and then Baker and Taylor gets bought by Ingram. Well, like, you know, these guys are still kicking out on Unix system. Like we need integration support. We need change management We've got a disrupted supply chain. And, well, John Gardner Sr. told me to use my smarts to set people apart. And I used to have to work for his distribution company sometimes. He owned troop trucks and moved records and moved, like, Ebony Jet magazine to other states and stuff. Oh, this is just a distribution problem. I'm from Chicago. I grew up in Printer's Row, man. I used to have to run half of the Roosevelt University bookstore. I know how this works. Let me help out. So it was a whole lot less about trying to compete in supply chain and a whole lot more about me proving that a market for the kind of 
black history intertwined, black American centric crime fiction that I like to write and aspire to, to, to be great at exists. Right. And so, but to do that, listen, man, I'm from Hollywood, okay? I get it. I've, I've done all of that stuff. I had the diversity programs like in the 70s and 80s when they were run by black people who were given grants by people like the city of Chicago and the federal government, okay? We got a lot of good self-appointed activity and we got a lot of good opportunities to discuss and dialogue the way we want genre fiction to go as it relates to race. But we don't have any discussion about the supply chain, which may equalize all of us because bookshelves need books. And there's room for everybody's books on the shelves. But if everybody leaves with a printing and shipping and distributing goes to last, nobody's guarding the last mile, it doesn't matter how many new black writers or any out writers of any persuasion that isn't the mainstream get in. Right. You're not shutting the back door to their economic value and their meaning that their careers won't sustain and they'll die in the marketplace and fall out of print. And 50 years from now, you won't even know that book exists. And somebody light-skinned and sexy like me will be the heir apparent to Walter Mosley when, in fact, it's been 80 folks writing mysteries. Right. It's just the supply chain won't put their books in the window because it's broken. And that ain't really racism. Now, a broken supply chain may only do so much for those who control it. And the functionality in a broken supply chain, the profitability from thereof, of thereof may only be reserved for folks who have control and power over that supply chain. But you fix that supply chain, we're all selling too many books for anyone to discriminate against anyone's title. Let's fix the supply chain, let's put everybody on equal footing in the global marketplace for books, and then let's decide whose mysteries are out of the mainstream and don't deserve to get printed, don't deserve an advance, don't deserve to get adapted, don't deserve to get protected. Okay, don't deserve to get a copyright, paper, copyright paperwork filled out for him, even though it's paying royalties to somebody all the time. Mm. And we got some broken stuff. And you know, man, I don't know. Uh, the economy is daddy, and daddy came home and the house wasn't clean. So we need to fix some stuff. And you can't be telling me that race is the problem that my books don't sell. And you can't be telling me that race is the problem I don't have a book deal when you don't know what the heck's really going on in the mm. book business. Because right now, Ingram can't even print books and nobody's trying to help them. Right. So, hey, man, again, a book like Ace Boom Coon will do three things for you. Number one, you, can't, you won't say you don't know black people after you read it. I'll tell you that. Much. So if you don't know black folks and you're interested in your cousin black Americans, pick up a Negro on an old fan Ace Boom Coon and then go to Hell's Chicken. Uh, and then, but um, if you want to examine how a book makes it round trip from an author to you and back, uh, a good, healthy understanding of the American supply chain for books and related goods and services needs to be undertaken by some folks who got some skin in the game. And I dropped a half million dollars of Noah Harris's money to build Bronzeville. And my grandson got a big old head and he's already got a funny tooth in the front. Now that's dentistry and we're going to do something about that head. Boy, your head is big. I'm just saying, like we need money. Yeah. We're all fighting over crumbs and we all know if there's small crumbs, white boys is getting them crumbs first. If there are more crumbs, nobody's angry about anything. We're experimenting more. We're reading each other more. We're printing more. We're shipping more. We're taking more returns. We're opening new markets. We're helping new bookstores get open. I'm not going to fight against another black person in a diversity program to have the number one black mystery. I'm trying to fight to have 10 black mystery writers up in here and 10 right. gay ones, you know? Yeah. You know, and 10 Martian ones. I'm trying to get all of them in here. So, Open the supply chain, uh, uh, fix the fissures between uh, a customer's order and it reaching them. Find a way to support libraries naturally. For every book you're not selling, let it wind up in a library nearby. You're preserving the brand and get off the e-books, man. If we have more e-books running around the libraries, we would at least know where our sales patterns are going to be for the future. Mm -hmm. But because we cut librarians off of being able to issue extra e-books right. for Communities that need them, we got nothing to track demand. Right. We need that. Now, everybody might not be a supply chain consultant like me. Everybody might not have left Del Comedy Jam and started working for Arthur Anderson, but that's what I have to contribute to the waffles. Like, that's, 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 that's my flavor, right? Now, I got a big mouth, always ask for forgiveness rather than permission, 
and I take the slightest insult as an opportunity to wage war to keep my motivation high because I might be a little manic depressed. But I got a publishing house that's running and right. it's getting books out right now when the industry needs us to start figuring out our own printing, our own warehousing, our own distribution. Bronzeville isn't me trying to compete with everyone else. Bronzeville is me trying to show that there is a market for something that we didn't consider before, and it may help widen markets out for all sorts of us. What we need is new readers. What we need is uh, people realizing that in this pandemic and in uncertain times, reading is a lifestyle activity, and that is an upscale lifestyle activity. You need at least $100 to enjoy a good book. I got to sell you some socks. I got to sell you a comfy robe. Hardcover is $32. You need some cocoa and whatnot. Maybe you smoke weed. I don't know if it's legal where you live. I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't get into that. But the point is, it'll take you $100 to curl up with a good book. Well, go and get your $100 on there. Be sedity. Be fun with it. Share. But get that supply chain moving. The books is getting stuck in funny places, man. Not in the hands of readers. No. I mean, we got to fix that. You can't tell me you discriminate against me when we all starving, man. Right. Give me a good open free market. Let everybody's product get equal footing on some shelves. And whoever makes it in the clearance bin and whoever makes it on the bestseller list fair and square, it proves our industry is healthy and people freely come and go. Right now, folks are showing up and they're staying too long. I'm talking about Walter and Stephen King a whole lot. And I love those guys. They're the framework for the way I built my relationship to fiction personally. Right. With Walter, I got a relationship with fiction as a black man for the first time. And with Stephen King, I had a relationship with my mama who loved his horror. And I needed those two relationships. We can get back to that. But I need both those books in the store, man, at a discount that I can afford. Right. And right now that's broken. And everybody knows it's broken. And Bronzeville is just me saying it ain't that broken where we can't find a solution here and there. Can I print everybody's books for them like I print mine? No. Do I have like lines of credit established to take on Random House and, 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 and try to make a play now that they ain't printing? But man, please, Random House can sneeze and ain't nobody thinking about Bronzeville. Am I lucky that, as my luck is all get out that Publishers Weekly treats us like we've always been here? Yeah, maybe they see how hard we're working. We got a great staff. We spend hard money. We got a good front list. Les Edgerton's book's coming after mine. I got Gail Massey after that. Nikki Dolce's audio book about to be some Hollywood, man. Like, the book business wants sexy. We could do it. Yeah. We could do it, man. Like we used to hand write books and save copies. We used to hire scribes. And now we don't know how to ship a book before I get there. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I love this business. I want to keep selling books. And I want to keep selling everybody's books. But we got to fix that supply chain, man. Careers are tied up in there. 401ks are tied up in there. Healthcare is tied up in there. The book business employs a lot of people. And unlike other retail outlets that are dying every day, bookstores are opening. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, hey, maybe some big, uh, maybe some big box retail movers aren't filling up their warehouses with books to make it easy for you to hop the New York Times bestseller list anymore. Doesn't matter. Got independent bookstores still opening doors. i am uh, been working with Caliba, the California Association of Independent Booksellers and Retailers. They've been helping me come up with a sales program just based on how people like to be treated. Boswell Books is our first wholesale customer. I'm printing books just to make certain they show up to the book launch on Friday. I like these kind of problems. They're jobs for people in these problems. And hey man, paper moves around the country with these problems. And ink moves around the country with these problems. And warehouses and, 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 and square footage has to get paid for with these problems. We could do it. Books are back and the economy's broken. Everybody needs entertainment. A book is like 80 different things now. Totally. And we can control that and people can eat. Uh, you know, hey man, come see me about who's the best writer. Come see me about who represents Black News the best. Come see me about what the greatest path for writers of color are. Once we're healthy, we got to get healthy. We got to help printers be able to support publishers so that they may do new and dynamic things. And we need the economy to open up so we may pay advances. So writers may stabilize their personal lives to finish their books on their books on deadline. And then we've got to just reserve money to make certain that marketing and advertising is always on point. So when we get Ingram to take all these books and it's always Ingram, 
Ingram knows they free in warehouse space because we're advertising. Right. Hit up the newsletters. Spend seven hundred and fifty dollars on Forward Magazine. Call Publishers Weekly and be like, "Dude, can I get a banner ad? I know I only got a hundred dollars. What can y'all do for me?" Introduce yourselves to people. Go to DEA. Tear off your ticket and, and, and sneak your boy in the back door by the bathrooms and both of you run over there and see what that chef's doing. You know, take a copy of your book in somewhere that ain't no business, you ain't no business being, and try to sell it to everybody until they find security to throw you out. Save the book business, man. We love books. We always want to brag about it. We always want to brag about on what, what bestseller list we're on, right? How about we brag about saving a bookstore here there? Same thing. You still get to get pat on the back. You still get to be the best person. The worst still get to be on Instagram sharing all your business. But we need to get this, this supply chain fixed. It's crazy. I mean, hey, man, Stephen King ain't eating right. We're all screwed. Yeah, yeah, that's when you know. Right? Get some books. Get them sold. Strengthen the supply chain. Listen to people who are independent, who are first movers. Talk to some self-publishers who know how to move books. Right. Get some ideas and feedback and trust when people are trying to help because, you know, we're all good people in the book business. We just write about a lot of ugly shit. Excuse my language if I'm not supposed to say that. So. No, that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I got one more question for you if you don't okay. mind. And then if you want to a little teaser for book three um, Ooh, last I question for you and this you know it can be uh, as pertains to writing and craft or if you want to speak more generally to life that's fine but the best advice that you ever got and the best advice that you never got and had to learn yourself I know right? best advice I ever got came from my cover artist who has been my best friend once removed because of my older brother Romel and they went to high school together, Reggie Pullian. And I'm getting the back matter finished for Ace Boone Coon and the acknowledgments and it's been an eventful couple of years and folks I thought I would be thanking ain't going on there. <laughs> and you know, I feel bad about it. And Reg and I go back, like Reg and I go back, like same neighborhood, Julian High School, park throwdowns and stuff in the shot, you know. And Reggie's a really smart dude. And when I knew he'd help me with covers for Bronzeville, I knew because Reggie would say no if he thought I was on some old second place mess, you know. Sure. And Reggie said, Danny, you should just write as if everyone you know is dead. <laughs> that was great. And, then it, and I wrote my acknowledgments like everybody I know is dead. It's just like, well, I know what that feels like. I buried a few people. And quite frankly, if they wanted me to say nice things about them, they had a chance to inspire me to do so. And that was the best advice that I got. And the best advice that was floating around the air, that it wasn't as if I got it so much as it was delivered to me with a cold slap. A very famous comedian who mentored me for years and treated me like his family saw fit to make a run for himself that I, I wouldn't have blamed him. We're on the set of a movie and, you know, it all dies down and everybody we got to try to be cool with. And, you know, it's all black comedians. And we all got to try to act like, tough and, you know, it's... I'm 19 years old, pretending like I'm 25. I ain't supposed to be with these grown-ups. They got families to free. To go home, go to college, little light-skinned boy. Like, it's like that, right? And then I realized I didn't mean anything in the grand scheme. And the way I was treated by these guys when there were higher stakes on the line than just everybody being cool with each other, what Bernie Mac taught me was you better be yourself before someone else gets away with doing it for you. So if you have anything to give, if you have anything to contribute that you're afraid, you're hesitant, do you before someone else does. Right. And because someone else that you love might have to, not because they want to, right. but because of scarcity and these, uh, and these false tactics of, of rationing opportunity. And then, you know, always putting political favor behind who gets promoted to what for the big chance. Man, many a time, another comedian I was tight with, 
I shared my sandwich with, bought a cup of coffee for, let crash on my couch for a few months, helped themselves to all sorts of my material. Because that's the only chance they're going to get to get a job. If there was enough to go around and people were being kind and offering opportunity to the best qualified people, we wouldn't stab each other in the back so much. Right. But while there's some backstabbing going on, tuck them in. Tape up your boobies, fold your ovaries up, tape up your hands. You bought, you bought into it. You got a novel. You may not write another one for 10 years. You're not going to wait another 10 years, are you? You got that idea, it burns within you. You write it before someone else does. You, you hate yourself. You will. Yeah. Be you before someone else does. If you believe in yourself, don't give in to the idea that someone other than you should go. Take your shot. It's like the Hunger Games. You ain't got to be nasty about it. You can be Katniss, but it's definitely the Hunger Games. You may regret but it's the Hunger Games. You may let folks go when you got them in the clutches because, well, you know what? Just, you know, but it's the Hunger Games. So you go in there. You want to be somebody else and die in the Hunger Games? They say, here lies Joe Blow. Wait a minute. That's not Joe Blow. That's my son, Danny, died in the Hunger Games. What's he doing here acting like he's Joe Blow? Be yourself. Knuckle up. Push past the thorns to get to the roses. Write your truth, take your lumps, and live to write another day. And don't let anybody get away with being a better version than you than you feel inspired to be yourself. Because that's like 49 years of me trying to impress other people to figure out what I should be. And now I realize I don't have to impress anybody to be what I should be. And now that I don't impress anybody, everybody wants to talk to me. It's weird, right? I know how that works out. You Can take you your highest... Take your highest and best self with you wherever you go, no matter what you do. And even though things might go wrong and you may be misunderstood and you may even fail, you have your highest idea staring of yourself staring back at you when you brush your teeth in the morning and you're going to need that. But for a lot of other stuff than just being a novelist or a comedian or a father or grandfather or something, you just got to have your highest idea yourself on in your back pocket and lead with it. So if you fail, at least it's your highest idea yourself going on the, you know, on the, on, in the L column, like when they put your picture on the, you know, blew it tonight. You know, your, your best. You left it out there. You, you it really fail, you might as well do it spectacularly. It means something. I tell you, it means something. I've succeeded doing things the right way. I've fallen into this whole thing of like looking the part and doing the right thing and marching in line and then I just couldn't take it anymore. And then I, Danny Gardner, Danny Gardner, always quit and always quit. And it's like, no, nah, man, it's going to catch up with you. If you feel like you're on the outside, then just stay on the outside and make them come outside to see you. Don't settle for being alone just because you're outside. Start a better party outside than they got in there if you got to stay outside. They'll come out there, but don't give in. Just despair sucks, man. Despair is the thing. Keep your shame to yourself. We all got something to be shamed about. Write your truth, take your lumps, sell your book, you know, and come see me at one of these award shows or conferences and you can try to take a swing at me if you want, if you don't like what I have to say. But at least you'll be in the game. That's right. At least you'll be in the game. Anyway, I, I, I hope we finish, man. I'm hot. That's right. All right, last thing then. You know, people are going to tear through this book. They're going to tear I through hope so. it. So, I hope so. And it's it's printing as we speak. It's literally printing right now. People can pick it up, but you know they're going to tear through it. They're going to want more. So what can you reveal about book three that you said is almost done? Cool. Uh, the book 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 one is about uh, fathers and sons, and how like you know you may not know somebody's being your father, and you may not know someone's your son. Book two is about friendship. And how your friends are who has you, you know, with an oar opposite you in the life raft, if nothing else. Book three is what I told my mother when I told uh, my girlfriend I shared a locker room, locker with in high school was pregnant. And so I bought this ring. A man doesn't earn his 
nobility, but by way of the heartbreak a woman passes to him. So book three is all about women. And my constant and incessant struggle to balance what I believe God wants from me with what I want from companionship. And I distilled that into uh, Tales of Elliot Capri's Girl Friday. And uh, you have to read book two to know what's going on. But if you read book two, a new member of the Fuquay family uh, might be coming to stay with the Caprices. Oh, nice. And she ain't exactly like Frank. <laughs> I was say, you just sold it. You did? Like, I'm down for book three. <laughs> yeah, but the at the same time, time. <laughs> yeah. The inclusion of Frank Fuquay's little sister Francine into the Caprice family household exacerbates Elliot's feelings about his relationships with women. One woman in, one woman in particular, which is Nadine Walker, who is the head of the uh, Women's Bureau of the Chicago Police Department at the long career when Elliot quit his career and they were quietly seeing each other and negotiating getting engaged when he got shot in book one. But once a girl has your heart, man, you ain't getting it back. So that's right, it's gone. <laughs> that's what it's about. It's about my inability to make my relationships with the opposite sex manifest the kind of person I've always wanted to be, even though I keep on trying. And I've managed to find where my voice and Elliot's voice are the same. So I'm going to be real truthful because... I mean, I'm no Casanova, but boy, I got some Hindenburgs. <laughs> <laughs> I got some real Hindenburgs, bro. If you have any idea, if you have any suspicion that Danny and Elliot are like alter, are alter egos of each other, well, you read book three. If we dated once, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it went into the batter. It all goes into the batter. That's all I got, man. That's all, all right. I got. I ain't got nothing else to sell you. It's got to be. Right. That's how you know it's real. Hey, it's real. hey Gardner, you are terrific. Thank you so much. This has been enlightening, illuminating. I should Thank probably you. let you eat your dinner now because you've been waiting on it for, you know, like an hour and a half. Nah, it's cold, man. It's cold already. I'm just going to eat a sandwich. <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. And everybody, pick up a spoon coon. You will not be sorry. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching. And be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.